Welcome to this model. This model is intended to show you or to demonstrate how p-value can be used as an indicator of statistical significance in microarray analysis. The larger point of view of this particular set of examples that I'm about to demonstrate to you is that you can apply them to different bioinformatics analysis such as sequence alignment where e-values will come into play and where you will need a functioning understanding of this particular value. This is start very simple with a microarray and the layout that I would like for you to focus on is a typical microarray layout in which you have a predefined number of genes the relative expression of which are measured in two different types of material. Traditionally, we would have a material which is denominated a control to which you would like to compare and a material with treatment. Now, every time that I say material, I want you to focus on having a set of replicates and desirably so, independent replicates. Now moving away from the schematic point of view, you will get to an experiment that looks very much like what you have on the screen right now, where you have the same section that you had before, but now you will have these quantifications of relative genetic expression. So you can identify here in the first column that you have your genes, the first part that is in a in, in the green color in the screen would be, in this case, a state of healthy tissues, or a collection of healthy tissues, and then a second set, which corresponds to 25 replicates, 25 different samples of tissues with cancer. Now, in the intersection of, the, of each of these genes and a particular tissue, you will find the quantification of relative genetic expression. As you can see in the slide, it's usually tens of thousands of genes that are involved in these kinds of experiments, and they are not cheap experiments at all. So when it comes to analysis, we can really have a great day analyzing them and putting together uh, different operations and come up with particular measures that we need to make sense of. And one particular interest could be, for example, the contrast between these two materials, the control material, or material A, and the material under treatment or with the particular condition of interest, which in this case is cancer. So we would like to compare these two as to elucidate which of those genes are important in separating this state from the other state. As in many analysis in biology, it is really from the field of biology that relevant questions arise. They are not statistical questions. We're going to use the statistics to try to find an answer or at least a piece of information that will help us make an answer to each of these questions. So you can come up with a series of questions such as what you have here. For example, did a gene, did a gene show significantly different relative expression values when comparing the two different states? Which is what I just explained to you in the previous slide. And these are, for example, called potential biomarkers. Now if the experiment was related to cancer, you have potential cancer biomarkers. Another question that you may pose is the following. Is a gene overexpressed or underexpressed? And that has to do with characterization. When we are trying to find what is the, uh, what is the role of particular genes that are at some point deemed important, then we would like to know which way it moves in terms of its relative expression. So that's another important question that we might 
ask and to which we might find an answer using statistics. And each of these basic questions eventually leads to other different questions, which are more elaborate. Nonetheless, we have still several statistical artifacts that can help us answer more complex questions, such as the last one that you have here. Did the relative expression of several genes change? And that usually takes place in a signal impact. Whenever you have an illness such as cancer, it is highly improbable that genes behave in an independent manner. Most likely, they are tied somehow in an articulate network of behavior in time, the nature of which we would like to identify and characterize properly. And yes, again, statistics can be used to find such a thing. Now, many of these ideas can be represented easily in, in different diagrams. As you may have guessed from a couple of previous slides, um, finding the potential biomarkers can be seen across an experiment in which you capture genes, your control material, and your material of a study, and these is are measured across. So we would like to identify which genes show a very distinct behavior from one state to the other, and therefore conclude that it has potential biomarking capabilities. <coughs> the last question that I posed in the previous slide has to do with this kind of behavior. So for this representation, you have a, a limited number of genes, in fact, just five. But the, uh, the key question is how are these guys related? How the behavior of one be overexpressed over or underexpressed correlates or affects some other gene so that whenever that happens, then this one receives a signal that it has to increase its expression or decrease its expression. And we, got, we can keep following that path towards all the genes of interest. And interestingly enough, that poses a highly combinatorial problem. And every time that you add uh, an additional gene, it will cause for the number of solutions to increase exponentially. And that's why we need mathematical artifacts and statistical artifacts to try to make sense of it. So going back to the original title of this module, a p-value. <coughs> so why does p-value can help to answer this question? And we have to define first what a p-value is. <coughs> first of all, a p-value has to do with a formal statistical inference procedure called hypothesis testing, right? And if you have taken basic statistics, you know that we do hypothesis testing every time that we are talking about inference. And in simple terms, it means collecting samples from real life in a limited number so that we can say something about a higher number of samples. A really, really high number of samples that is called a population. And that's what inferential statistics are all about. We will cover that in a couple of slides. And in inferential statistics, we identify hypothesis testing as the formal method to decide upon two competing statements about the behavior of a population or a group of populations. So that's what we want to do. Somehow, p-value has to be related to inferential statistics. And that's our starting point. We said that we're trying to get information from our own world so that we can make a conclusion about something that is larger than our set of samples. 
So in this sense, we can divide or we can identify two different worlds. Our world, which is down here, and the world of mathematics, or as I like to call it, the world of big numbers. Now, if everything you were interested in lived in this world, in our world, so that you have a convenient way to measure every single entity that you are interested in, then we would not need to make an inference. All we have to do is just count whatever phenomenon or whatever occurrence we are interested in and they say something about it. And that will be correct. But in the recognition that we usually have a lot more samples so that it becomes unmanageable to measure them all, we have to go into inferences. We need to get a limited set of data so that we can say something about the population. That means that we need to infer something that is happening that we cannot possibly measure in our lifetime or with our current resources. <coughs> so in that sense, in our world we have samples, and these are usually in our three-dimensional three -dimensional world from which we recognize that these samples have inherent variability and therefore they create distributions. Right? And so the distribution is simply the way that we describe variability in a particular measurable quantity that we call the variable. <coughs> now with these distributions, usually we are able to come up with functions, mathematical functions, which mean something to us. For example, the average is a very simple one. The standard deviation is another. A proportion is another one. And these are called statistics. And again, if all we were interested in lived here in our world and we would have convenient access to measure everything that we can, that we are interested in, then we would be right here we can make averages, we can come up with standard deviations and proportions, and that would be the end of it. But our interest here is in doing inference. It means trying to measure something in our world that means something for a larger number of samples, which in statistics we call a population. So in the world of big numbers, in similar to what we have in our real world, we have samples. If we have a large number of samples, uh, uh, something that we cannot measure conveniently, we'll have a population. Right? For example, the number of people in a classroom, we can measure right away, we can count. But if we want to count the number of, say, number of students under 19 years old in a particular classroom, and we would like to say something about the population of all classrooms in a university that will be pretty inconvenient. So we can measure something in our world and then try to make a statement about something that we cannot measure conveniently. That is about a population. <coughs> now the populations, they have been studied for a while, so they have come up and with population distributions. You know, you are probably familiar with many of them at this point. Uh, the normal distribution, it's kind of a mixture between these two, the exponential distribution, the Poisson distribution, so on and so forth, are all uh, instances of this category right here. <coughs> now, these population distributions are meant to be mathematically convenient. So they are usually functions, mathematical functions, which depend on a couple of parameters. And in particular for inference statistics, these parameters are necessarily population parameters. Now, if we see these two worlds in parallel, we can see that the statistics that we are able to gather from our world are trying to estimate the parameters that belong to the population world. 
And that connection right here, that connection that we call estimation, is our artifact to come up with the conclusions in hypothesis testing. We make up hypotheses about this world right here, for our population, and our way to do that is measuring things here. So we're trying to estimate the behavior of a population that is a lot larger. So in this process of estimation, I'm bringing together both of the worlds, uh, the real world and the big number world, <coughs> we have hypothesis testing. And all hypothesis, hypothesis testing does is try to discriminate one hypothesis from another, from a total of two. And these two hypotheses, they compete with each other and they cannot exist at the same time. Either one is true and the other is false or the other way around. But you cannot hope, you cannot have both of them being true at the same time and you cannot have both of them being false at the same time. So in these two competing hypotheses, we have a null hypothesis which is usually taken to be a status quo. Now, if you think about a, somebody who makes something against the law, you can think about presumed innocence. That's pretty much what the, the null hypothesis is. It's our presumed status, a presumed innocence. If nothing else happens, we will keep this null hypothesis without doing any further testing. If we cannot, come, we cannot come up with enough evidence against the null hypothesis, then we will keep it. But if we have enough evidence, then we will have to go to the competing hypothesis, which we call the alternative hypothesis, and which challenges the status quo. And of course, like I said before, in order for us to get to the alternative hypothesis or to conclude an alterna alternative hypothesis, we would need enough evidence. And in that particular sentence lies the secret of the p-value. Now, the uh, alternative hypothesis would be uh, as similar to a verdict of guilty in a trial. So let's make you let's make use of that. Let's make use of a trial and try to see if we can, we can understand the process of hypothesis testing as a trial. So, in a trial, <coughs> you have two hypotheses that, con that compete. Either the person who has been accused is innocent, or he or she is not innocent or is guilty. They cannot be true at the same time. They cannot be false at the same time. Either one is, either one is true and the other not, or the other way around. So, depending on different laws of different countries, you have something that is presumed at the very beginning. In the U.S. system, that would be presumed innocent. So the initial hypothesis is that an accused person is innocent. If nobody presents charges or nobody brings evidence forth, then this is the hypothesis that we will keep, that the person is innocent. Now, whenever you have a trial, you are trying to bring evidence against this person. So bringing, bringing back that, sent, that famous sentence that somebody is innocent until proven guilty, then that proven word means until enough evidence is presented so that we can conclude that a person is not innocent. So yes, a trial has a null hypothesis, presumed innocence, and has, has an alternative hypothesis in which the person is found not innocent or guilty. Of course, we need to decide upon these two alternative hypotheses, or these two competing hypotheses, and 
because we started with the null hypothesis, we state that we are going to reject the null hypothesis, or in simple words, we're going to find the person guilty if we have enough evidence. All right? So, if we put it, start to put it in mathematical terms, if the evidence that we have is more than enough. So that being more than enough means that somebody or something has to determine when enough is enough. So for that matter, that threshold is determined by the law. It is a theoretical agreement between the people of a particular nation saying, well, if you go above this amount of evidence, then the person is guilty. And there is a constitution behind it, and it can be consulted. It, it can be interpreted, but everybody, every time that you go to that book, you will find that threshold. So that, going back to the whole statement, so that if you find enough evidence, and enough is defined by this threshold, then you would reject the, the null hypothesis. And therefore, the person, if you reject this, then the person will be, find, will be found to be not innocent or guilty in simple terms. <coughs> so if so far you have understood this particular setup, then we can move to probabilities. <coughs> now, if uh, the evidence that I present you may think in a trial that you have evidence that is of high quality and there is evidence that is of low quality. And usually quality, the quality of the evidence determines the credibility. Now if we could associate the, um, the quality of the evidence to something that pro we could probably heard from many TV shows that is circumstantial evidence, then we'll have an understanding that circumstantial evidence is not particularly good as evidence against somebody who's been accused. So, we would like for the probability of this evidence that we are presenting against the accused, we would like for the probability of this evidence of being circumstantial or of low quality, we would like for that probability to be really low so that the evidence that we have is solid or is not circumstantial. Let me repeat that. The probability that the evidence is not circumstantial, it is desirable for the prosecutor anyway, it is desirable for it to be small. You would like to your evidence for your evidence to be solved. So, if you want for this to be small, then you want to make it small enough so that it's below the probability associated to what the law established as the limit for your evidence. So, in that sense, you have two different sources. You have evidence, which is coming from our world, which is something that we can measure, and we can compute a probability for it. <coughs> and you have a threshold that comes from a theoretical point of view, that is something contractual between people from a particular state for its own, that put in a in legislation and in a constitution for its particular protection, and we can come up with a particular theoretical level or theoretical probability. So you can easily see here the two natures. One that is coming from our world that is measurable and the other one that is coming from the theory, constitutional or law theory in this case. So in summary, if you, are, you have somebody accused a person is accused of a crime, then in the United States it's assumed to be innocent or presumed innocent. 
and the alternative that it is not innocent. So we would like to reject the null hypothesis, that means getting to a verdict of guilty, if we present enough evidence and the word enough is defined by the law or somehow quantified by the law. So that we have evidence that comes from our world and a theoretical value here. If we think of probability, we would like for the probability of this evidence being bad evidence or low quality evidence or circumstantial evidence, we would like for this probability to be really, this really small. And we would like for it to be smaller than a probability associated to that theoretical. And that pretty much sums up a trial. Right? We have work to do, we have we have to decide at the end either we stay with the null hypothesis or that we have enough evidence against it. That is that we have the alternative hypothesis. <coughs> And now, let me take you to the statistical samples, <coughs> where you have hypothesis testing. Uh, in a similar manner that you had in the trial, you have uh, null hypothesis, which is pretty much the same, where you are presuming or you are assuming about a particular population parameter. And remember, this is, this is inferential statistics, right? We would like to make inference about populations, not about samples. Samples we can measure right away, but not populations. So we're trying to make an inference and we have to say something about it to begin with. The null hypothesis is that the population has a mean, which is a population average if you want to think of it that way. A population has a mean of 20 units. And that null hypothesis is going to compete with the alternative hypothesis where it says something that competes with our initial statement. And again, both of them cannot be true at the same time. <coughs> In this case, we say the population has a mean larger than 20. So you can verify that they cannot be true at the same time and they cannot be false at the same time. <coughs> In a similar manner to what we had in the trial, we need a rejection criteria. So we would like to reject the null hypothesis if there is information that we are gathering from our samples, from whatever we can measure in our real world, in terms of, in this case, the mean, which in samples we need the average of different samples. And just recalling from the previous slide, every time that we make a function of values that come from samples, we call that a statistic. So we have a statistic here that is measuring my evidence or that is quantifying my evidence against the null hypothesis. <coughs> now we would like for that evidence to be really large or large enough. Enough, in this case, is not determined by the law, but is determined by the theoretical distribution of your population. So it really comes from a theoretical uh, from a theoretical point of view. So you would like for that evidence gathered from our real world to be larger than a particular threshold which comes from statistical theory and a particular statistical distribution. And this is starting to sound really similar to what we have here in the trial. Because in here, we have the evidence that comes from our world, and then you have something determined by the law, which is also theoretical. So if we continue with our parallel, then we can measure the probability associated for this value to happen just randomly. And that would be similar to having evidence that is circumstantial. It doesn't, it is not solid enough, right? So if something just happens randomly or it happens by chance, then you probably don't want to take it along into account, right? Because you are talking about, after all, you're talking about science here, you're talking about 
train come up with a strong conclusion. So you would like for the probability associated to these sample statistics happening just by pure chance to be really low. Now, how low does you have to be? Well, you are coming here from your in this column here. We are coming from the real world, and in the complementary column, you are coming from the theoretical point of view. So in the theoretical point of view, because you have a threshold and a distribution, then you can compute a probability associated to that. So that if we want to reject the null hypothesis, then we can come up with a statistic, and we can come up with a probability of that statistic happening by pure chance. That is being purely circumstantial. And, well, what do you know? That probability we call the p-value. And we try to compare this p-value against a theoretical value, which in this case is a probability that is coming from a theoretical distribution, and we call that the significance. And for the friends of the statistics, they just simply call it alpha, the alpha value. So, in summary, what you are, whenever you are doing hypothesis testing, and believe me, in bioinformatics you will have plenty of opportunities to do that. If you want to come up with a conclusion, something, a conclusion about the two competing alternatives, about a particular parameter of a distribution or a population, right? The, um, then you will have to do this procedure here. And hopefully, this parallel that I have drawn here between a trial in a criminalistic law and our hypothesis testing hopefully helps you understand why we need for this p-value not only to be measurable, right, to be computable, but we need it in a context in which we can compare it to a theoretical significance. And in getting to that point, to compare p-value to alpha, you know, computing this probability to a theoretical probability, then with that information, we can finally come back here and choose one alternative over the other. In the next module, we're going to work out a particular example, and we'll come back to this to this uh, setup that we have here. But hopefully, you found that this you found these slides particularly useful. Otherwise, please let me. Know.